started tonight, um, I want to start as we always do with a word of prayer. And as always, I would like for one of um, our students to lead us in a word of prayer. So which one of our students would like to guide us to our time together and an encounter with God? Okay, if you would, sir. With all heads bowed. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that is ours to share, God. We welcome the Holy Spirit in this place, God. We thank you, God, for coming in the room to give us a time of experience and encounter with you to learn, sharpen those tools, and equip us with the gifts that you have bestowed and blessed us with, God. We thank you for the leadership and the prophet, Dr. Johnson, on tonight. I pray that each individual that's a part of this class leave different. Mm -hmm. Do not leave out the same. We thank you for intellectual insight and spiritual empowerment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Tonight, um, I want for us to explore and examine Dr. King's conflict with other African American leaders during his time. And so our time is going to be spent um, taking a look at the different movements, the different voices, and the different perceptions. Most of the time what we begin to uh, explore and examine is Dr. King's wrestling with Euro-American voices, right. the dominant culture. However, King ran into challenges, yes. ran into conflicts, and I put some of those in your portal so that you might see some of those voices. And we want to look at not only those voices, but their challenges to Dr. King, mm -hmm. challenges to the movement, challenges to his philosophy, his strategy, and then their alternatives. And finally, how Dr. King responded to those challenges. We want to look at how, in the latter part of our discussion, his understanding of Satyagraha, Ahimsa, which we have examined, how those perceptions shaped his understanding as well as his understanding of the Christian ethic of love, agape, philia, which was in our exploration of Ansbro's work. So tonight we're going to look at these movements, we're going to look at these voices, and we're going to go through them so that we can understand that Dr. King was one voice during the civil rights movement. He was one civil rights leader. And the challenges that he faced externally in the larger community, as well as the challenges he faced from African Americans. Okay? So, I have a PowerPoint that I put in your portal. But I wanted you to hear it. Diverse voices and paths to freedom. And I'm really getting that from Robert Franklin, Dr. Robert Franklin, who was at Emory. All right, Dr. Franklin, and we're going to see it, he will write a book about the African American journey and how that journey has always been diverse in the way it approached the uh, desire for freedom. Okay? And a lot of these voices were pitted against each other, okay? Like Booker T and Frederick Douglass. And then comes W.E.B. Du Bois and his talented 10th uh, perception, okay? And so when you start looking at it, when you start really exploring it, they really are in search of freedom and liberation for an oppressed people, but they have different lenses, different ways that they not only see how this can be accomplished. Booker T saying, put down your buckets. Let's work, OK? As we are with our European former slave masters, fingers on one hand. Let us put down the bucket. Let us work together to build a nation. But then comes Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Never has, and it never will. And so he saw agitation, okay? Then again, you have Du Bois and his talented tent, but then you have black nationalism with Marcus Garvey, 
We can't work with these folks. They're never going to let us be a part of this American pie or dream. Therefore, we need to establish our own nation. <clears throat> this, these three or four perceptions are just a, a small portion of a larger ideology, okay? Or what we would call ideologies or understandings. So one of the things I want to I wanna look at is the scripture. Listen to it. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had indeed married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has the Lord not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Okay, so even in the biblical writ, there have always been what? Challenges. Challenges. What else? Critics. Critics. Conflicts. Conflicts. About, well, what's the best way? Okay? And I want y'all to hear that because I don't want y'all to do like when we really are studying it, well, these folks were wrong and King was right. No. There were diverse ways that they saw and understood out of their experiences. Much like Job and his three friends. Okay? So throughout the biblical writ as well, because Job's three friends show up, and they are scribes like Job, and they turn around and they say, wait a minute, our traditional understanding, our experiences, suggest that this is our image of God, this is what God wants us to do, your situation. And so King will go through this as he is challenged by these voices, these perceptions, these other movements. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Even um, in the reading that you sent out from the digest, and even in light of this, doesn't it say, suggest that there should be a sensitivity about not that who God uses or who doesn't, but when it's an appropriate moment? That, that there are times when, even though in, in that reading with, um, he may have been for a moment, mm -hmm. but instead of instead of relinquishing and saying okay there's something else that needs yes. to be added to yes. this mm -hmm. saying okay no I'm just it bag on it no we'll stay it right. mm -hmm. right. um, for us to be sensitive even in this that there's diversities but but when there's something else that needs to be brought to the forefront yeah. even for a moment if it's for a moment or whatever season mm -hmm. we need to relinquish and be sensitive mm -hmm. yeah, no I think you're absolutely right I think the aspect of it is um, if you remember when we started talking about the zeitgeist moment, mm -hmm. what is that moment? And who is God using? And how has this shift taken place? Mm -hmm. So we should be sensitive to it. They should have been sensitive to it. But like you said, there were these power plays. There were these ways of understanding. There were these struggles. What I wanted you all to see and hear, and it was not that he was just fighting these white folks. Right. These European, he's fighting his own folks. Right. All right, there's this struggle. All of them trying to figure out what's the best way right. to arrive. Mm -hmm. And the article that you're talking about is is J. H. Jackson. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, sir. So, so was it what you just said? Was it about how to, or was it about who it was? I think it was a combination of both. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a combination. As as we really take a look at it, many scholars have said. J.H. Jackson was one of those individuals who was just not going to step down. Right. And he, yeah. Who? Power yeah. Too. Okay. And he, he, but he did have this philosophy, and he had become uh, this main voice because he had been president of the National Baptist Convention. Convention. For a long time. Yeah. He was the major voice. Right. Now, most historians will say, um, particularly David Garrow um, and other King scholars, that that position really made you like the black president, right. okay, in our community. Because that's the largest, the National Baptist was the largest, Absolutely. So, uh, largest conglomeration of, of African Americans working together, that religious body. So all of a sudden, he has a lot of power. Right. And to relinquish that, I think it's, you know, not only his philosophy, but I think it has something to do, as most, as Garrow says, with the fact that I'm wielding a lot of power. Right. Yes, ma'am. If they only could have pulled their theories 
and came together, mm -hmm. looking in the future for what the Negroes needed mm -hmm. or what the kingdom needed, they could have been great mm -hmm. working together. But it because it became, it's been done like this, I'm been the one, they lost the vision. I think, I think, again, what... Um, what Ms. Johnson, Ms. Gwen Johnson has said is true. What, what is God up to during that time? How do we sit and begin to ascertain what God is up to? And I think that's, that's for me, that, that's the way of us coming together to say, okay, we have different understandings, we've got different perceptions, but as we take a look, what is, the, what is in the best interest of our people, their future, and wrestling with this strategy of how best, okay, to really accomplish the objective and agenda where we are right now. Okay? Can I ask? Yes. Can you say at this point that uh, Martin Luther was not able to bring all the elite together, to work together? Yes. He failed in that. Yes. He failed. He was not able to bring all of these diverse groups together. You are absolutely right. Even with inside of the National Baptist, because remember, Dr. King was a National Baptist preacher. And so um, J.H. Jackson is really not in favor of King. There is a schism. I see it because when we had this problem in Kenya, what President Kenyatta did mm -hmm. was to bring all the elites mm -hmm. together. And uh, before they addressed the mass, and they came together and worked together, then whatever they concluded, they mm -hmm. concluded, now they take outside the mass. Mm -hmm. And this, this is how they came with the old, holding the people who are going to agree with the idea. If you don't agree, there was, <laughs> this was not non violent, it was violent. Okay. Because if you don't agree with the, the movement, mm -hmm. There was no going back but killing you. Yeah. Mm. You well, don't destroy the movement. But this is given because it was non violent. Uh -huh. But they were not able, whoever was able, no, none of them was able to unite the best might yeah. before they come to the public. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, and then yes, ma'am. I saw the conflict, or I saw the, the J.H. Jackson power struggle as a necessary conflict. Okay. Because had it not been for that, because his father was a, a, in favor of him, and then when this happened, you kind of see a, a separation of ideas, but it also gives King the opportunity to rise as a leader. Mm -hmm. Had it not been an opposition, had it been that everyone with, with J.H. Jackson's opinion that he should continue to be president, mm -hmm. then that would be the only voice that you would have continued to hear until mm -hmm. he died. Yeah. And so I saw the conflict as necessary mm -hmm. in order for King to come to realization into a position of, wait a minute, there needs to be a new leader, you know, great movements are born out of a desperate moment saying, wait a minute, this, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And had everyone went with the opinion, his voice never would have been heard. It just would have been Jackson and whatever Jackson went for. So sometimes conflict can bring about great moves within a nation. A lot of um, scholars will agree with you. Um, Jackson wielding a lot of power and, and the movement or the schism between National Baptists and Progressive Baptists which will emerge out of that, gives King another voice. Um, his, his struggle with Dr. King, however, King was never going to be president. That was not going because King had already moved on the world stage. So Jackson and, and, and his um, struggle with relinquishing power because Gardner Calvin Taylor would have stepped to the forefront, and that faction was inside of national, the National Baptist Convention, they would have, have taken the forefront. Remember, J.A. Jackson was saying we did not need to move in these rebellious acts. Y'all remember reading that? That's, that's in that's, Christian. Yeah, that's not Christian. Don't do this. So he was more of the Booker T. Uh, let's just accommodate, let's compromise. And you all need to hear that because that was a part of some of the movement of accommodationalist, right. all right, okay. compromise versus 
Right. Militancy. Yes. Okay. Can you, yeah. Can you get this slide? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I was about, just about to walk okay. on. It's okay. Oh, the reason why I was saying about coming together because they saw King as in, as you just spoke of, as an activist. So they yeah. couldn't put him in the church or in God's business. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's like to them, two different visions. Oh, it was, it was more than that. So let's take a look at those visions. Okay, here is Malcolm X, mm -hmm. King, mm -hmm. Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. that SNCC, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. So we've got student, nonviolent. Okay, good. Now we've got who was representing Nation of Islam? All right, we have Stokely. First, he was he was also a part of, but then becomes Black Panther. All right, so then we got Black Panther, and so now we've got now who in the world is this? No, that's Fannie Lou Hamer. Okay, Mississippi Democratic. Party. Say that again, sir. Mississippi Democratic Party. Mississippi Democratic Party. But she was also part of SCLC too, right? She was SCLC. She also was a part of founding member SNCC. Yes, right. See, it's a lot going on during that time. King is not the only one and is not the only voice or the only strategy. Right, right. There's a lot that was occurring as human beings started talking about how oppressed people seize power for some, obtain rights for others. But there's a lot that's transpired. Okay? So these were some of the movements. So let's take a look at the movements and their strategies. Yo, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I'm struggling with one thing. When okay. I hear the voices that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. Michael, uh, the other guys, okay. they all try to talk about the African American. Why yes, sir. The concerns. Mm -hmm. Why is it that uh, King is the one that uh, got the, the highlights? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of scholars say mm -hmm. because King is more acceptable to the dominant society and to those in power. So King's methodology is more pleasing, and so we have elevated Dr. King um, because of the dominant culture saying this was acceptable. We don't like Malcolm. We don't like Stokely and what they were arguing. Okay. However, scholars like Dr. Um, Louis Baldwin at Vanderbilt will argue that you have to have all of these diverse voices, going back to your argument, in order for, for this society to change. And it's, it chose the nonviolent and the one that was less aggressive. Okay? Because these others, a lot of them, particularly Stokely and, and uh, the Nation of Islam, and the Black Panthers, they were not talking nonviolence. No, no, no. Although Stokely started out, no, no. okay, and that's in your article as it talked about Stokely. So Stokely is nonviolent, but after 1965, when things started to kind of look like they were not going anywhere, right. it takes a more radical approach. Yes, yes ma'am. That was my question about the Black Panthers, the information that's available out there has a slanted view. Yes. But what's, what's the actual, what actually happened with that party? Because you hear of the guns and the violence and all mm -hmm. of that, but it just seems, it seems too far-fetched in mm -hmm. some cases. So what actually did happen? A lot of um, scholarship and a, and a lot of investigation says that the government turned, a lot of, it, a lot of drugs were planted, um, and a lot of their leaders were then incarcerated. And so you start to see the Black Panthers um, end up being decimated because they're talking about overthrowing the government. 
They really, they really are a very militant voice okay. during that time. So it really was militant. You have to understand they were young too. They were 19, 20, 21, 22 years yeah. old. So, you know, for the government's subversive or co coercion or subversive action uh, was, I say, successful because of the age. The age. Um, and then and in being in the 60s with the drug culture. Right. And you know, and the introduction of that into the community. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Another uh, side of the Black Panthers that usually is not voiced what they did in Washington D.C. with the children. Mm -hmm. They were very proactive right. with children. Uh, Head Start. Mm -hmm. They were there. Yeah. Their presence, um, even protecting. They, whatever yeah. needed to be done, they did it. And I, and, I, and I appreciate that because that is true. We usually get a negative image mm -hmm. of the Black Panthers and never hear about their breakfast feeding programs. The 10-point plan. Yeah, the 10-point plan. And, and, and folks, that should have been in the portal because I put that in so that you all can see. But it, a part of it is also on this PowerPoint because I want you all to hear that, wait a minute, Everybody is not marching behind King. There are other strategies. Black Panthers are not just these militant folk. They're protecting communities. Right. They're out and acting as stop signs inside of our communities where there were no stoplights and no stop signs. They're acting as crossing guards for children. They had a major, major. child major. program. Major. All right. Um, Chairman Mao, they were passing out information. They were, they were really educating yeah. about diverse ways and perceptions and philosophies. So, yeah, economics, which we will hear Stokely talk about when he really starts talking about black power, that being a part, which Dr. King then has to respond to. Mm -hmm. Okay? What, what's the 10 point plan? It's all new to me. Um, if you allow me, it's in your portal, but we're going we're gonna to talk about it because they came up with a plan of how. They weren't just talking about doing these things. They were talking about how you're going to accomplish it. Okay? Yes, ma'am. And at that time, they, the Panther Party really encouraged self-esteem. Yeah. And that made a difference, a big difference in how black people organized the state together as right. far as marching and even being in all kind of parties. Right. At that time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you hit the next slide? Oh, let me go through this. This is Dr. Robert Franklin, and as, as you can see, and I just wanted you all to see Dr. Franklin, who has done um, work on visions about liberation and the diverse voices and how the African-American community has not just been one voice, okay? So um, Dr. Franklin, a president emeritus of Morehouse College, former presidential distinguished professor of ethics at, social ethics at Emory, former director of Candler's uh, Black Church. He also was uh, president of the Interdenominational Theological Center. So this, this is an educator, okay? Can you hit the next slide, please? Okay, this is his book, Liberating Visions, Human Fulfillment and Social Justice in African American Thought. And his premise has been that the African, African American community has always had diverse voices, approaches, and visions for accomplishing liberation and human fulfillment. It is nothing new. So when Dr. King rises, there were voices that were already active. There were voices that also came along with him. There will be voices that emerged after him. But these were visions toward what? Human fulfillment and liberation. How best to accomplish this. Okay? So all of them are really talking about what's the best way of getting to the goal, and what's the goal. And those two are the goal, liberation and human fulfillment. Okay? This is J.H. Jackson or Joseph H. Jackson, pastor of Mount Olivet Baptist Church. And remember, he will be the president of the National Baptist Convention, which at that time was the largest African-American body that was pulling together religiously. And so he was opposed. He was an opponent of King. 
When Cain goes and tries to initiate, okay, this move to the north and tries to begin to talk about liberation and human fulfillment for African Americans in the north, he goes into the slums, he goes in, into these ghettos, he goes into these places, even lives there, and he has this summer program where he's trying to empower people. He opposes them. He says no. Matter of fact, when King tried to do it on several occasions, bring individuals together, Jay Jackson sent out. He sent out to the different pastors because he was a part of Daly's machine. And he's like, we don't have problems here. Okay? And so he shuts it down. But he also believes, again, in Booker T's, we just need to work together. We need to work with those in power. We don't need to be stirring up all of this. And as my sister said, this is unchristian. We should not be these wonderful people out here protesting, turning things upside down. We need to pray and be nice. Y'all have heard that kind of philosophy, but there were African Americans that said. Okay. Yes, sir. We have an economic connection to the daily machine. Yes, sir. In Chicago, so that, that's a, obviously a reason why he opposed King. Yes, sir. That would have, have restructured the, the normal Chicago society and affected his bottom line. You got, you have that right. <laughs> <laughs> and scholarship backs that up. It's like no, no. and he, he's now he's and don't get it twisted. He is an eloquent preacher. He is a preacher. By he is charismatic. Okay. Uh, and he has the largest African-American church in America at that time. Okay? He has the largest, so, you, you, like you said, it's going to affect his bottom line in Chicago. And you got to know, daily. You ain't going in there talking about you going to just turn daily stuff, which King will find out. Okay? Because his northern campaign does not go well at all. Fails miserably. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, don't you behold uh, somewhere at Jackson feeling like uh, Martin Luther was about to challenge his uh, leadership platform, and therefore, even if he was pro whatever Martin Luther was talking about, he would not have felt like uh, welcoming the whole idea uh, because his leadership was kind of a uh, challenge. Oh, yeah, most definitely. And it was spreading inside of, of the convention that he was leading. That's the reason why, again, um, before that, Jackson was just, I mean, it was an automatic thing, president. Right. And then so it wasn't just, he wasn't emeritus then. It was unchallenged. Yeah, right. Nobody was challenging. No. But then all of a sudden, there was King, there's talk about King doing this, that, and the other, which, again, most scholarship will show there's no way. King would have been able to, to move into that kind of position. He had too much going on. However, it raised questions and caused for the challenge, as my brother said, challenge to his leadership and challenge of power. And then the Reverend Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor is then put against him. And that, because Dr. Taylor is an extraordinary preacher in his own right, right. and leading a... a leading uh, an extraordinary growing church. And so there's a younger movement that is really causing problems. Right. Yes, sir. Do you, with your knowledge of that, do you think that it would have benefited the movement if Dr. King would have took that position to lead the, the convention? No. It would have derailed it. Okay. It, would have, it would have caused, it, it, it would have shifted his focus. His focus needed to be on the global stage, right. in the nation, on, on the global. His king is going to move <coughs> onto the world stage. Right. He, he, had already, he had already moved to that place. Because it seemed limited. like he was already bigger than the yeah. convention once his name was ever mentioned, right. you know. Right. It, it, that would not have been a good movement. Move, how, excuse me, move on. How, how do you see the difference between nonviolence and uh, well, I think nonviolent resistance was the godly way. Um, I think, for me, in my perception, um, what J.H. Jackson was proposing was that we wait 
again that we, have, and you'll hear it when we talk about um, Dr. King, um, because I've got an excerpt of Dr. King responding to that, okay? What does it mean when we start talking about nonviolent resistance and how he defines that? And that's going to be important, okay? Can you hit the next one? Okay, here is Roy Wilkins, prominent civil rights leader in his own right, NAACP, okay? He gets upset with King because he thinks King is working too independently, that he needs to work with the NAACP. And so he sends a letter to King. We have an agreement that we will work together, and you are working independently. I thought your organization. So Roy Wilkins has some issues with King because Wilkins has been a part of the Pullman protest, and I mean, his, his leadership goes back years. So this is an older God now that is being upset about these new upstarts that's coming and talking about, no, we're going to do it this way. So Wilkins is another one of those that is having issues with, with King and this SCLC, Southern Christian. Christian. Oh. It changed over the years. That's what it used to be. And, and the funny part about it is that you're right. There are a lot of younger people who don't see it as this Christian leadership, but cantankerous, trying to still hold on. So look at time again, shift and change, and the images and the perceptions. Okay? But Roy Wilkins, okay? All right. In the strictest meaning of the term, and I wanted you all to understand, black nationalism refers to those ideas and movements that are associated with the quest to achieve separate statehood for African Americans. Nationhood. Because Marcus Garvey was saying, hey, let's pick up, let's leave here, let's get on out of here, they're not going to go, uh -uh, this is not the place for us. Now, Malcolm X will also take that kind of mindset. Let's develop states for African Americans. Give them theirs, we get ours. It's a separatist mindset. So now we got accommodationalists and we have what? Separatists. Okay? Black nationalism. Okay? So we're going to see this because you're going to see several of them. And again, Black Panthers are going to take Malcolm's mindset who was building on Garveyism, and then all of a sudden, they're going to take it a step further. Okay? Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It was Marcus Garvey who considered all black nations to come together. That's why he really stressed the fact that we need to get out of here and come together in another area of the world. Because he saw worldly nationalism. I mean, as the, world, as, the, as the world is concerned, we saw other continents who should be involved in the black struggle. He, again, that's why he, he wanted to get this big ship, big ship, get all the black folks on that ship, which he got, you know, he got conned. He did. He got conned, a lot of, a lot of money was, not, I don't think on his part. I think he was operating, and I mean, scholarship is, is kind of sketch on both sides. But anyway, there's a, there's a lot in that. He really thought that, like you said, the best way of dealing with this problem was to leave, not stay here, not fight. Just let's all get together, get on this ship, and let's go. Okay? Hit it again. All right. During the modern period, especially after World War II, black nationalism encompasses more broadly both those who favor true political sovereignty through separate statehood and those who favor more modest goals like black administration of vital private and public institutions. And y'all also see slogan Black Power, which is Stokely Carmichael and is delivered 1966. Yeah, Black Power. So it's, go it's gonna move. And that's where, like you said, that, that economics, that political, no, not black statehood, but us achieving power. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Again, in D.C., uh, the Black Caucus mm -hmm. was very um, active during that time up mm -hmm. until 
the 80s actually, the National Black Caucus every year. Uh, right. They were mm -hmm. all over national. They would come to D.C. and um, different, but every year there was a different uh, goal, different objective, <laughs> and it was, it was great. It's a, it was empowering yeah. because, again, you're building on a premise. The question, I think, for 21st century is why aren't we still building on different tenets and perceptions that were advanced <coughs> by other ideologies, other movements, as you said, the Black Caucus, which at one time was focusing on black power. Okay? But now we've walked away from... Because we've not redefined it, right. we've not incorporated it, we've not explored it. Because as my African brother back there said, we've lifted up Dr. King, but in one of the books that um, I did not, and I started to, to place on our list, talked about how we have whitenized Dr. King. We, we have taken his perceptions and made them more passive. Okay? All right. Will you hit that? Yes, ma'am. It, even in saying as far as the more modest goals like black administration and stuff as far as us being in, in positions mm -hmm. how does how is that so insignificant now because in my mind you, you have Eric Holder saying well if we could if we're in a position to do something about me do <laughs> do you know who you are <laughs> I, I mean, or is, or am I missing something? I mean, well, I think a part of it has been that we have come to the point to where we think we have arrived, exactly. we're on an equal playing field, mm -hmm. and that this struggle is no longer needed or no longer occurring. And so, one of the things that you have to understand is that these individuals, very as as my brother pointed out, they were very young, mm -hmm. but they again were having the image of racism, exclusion, <laughs> brutality, they were seeing it. We, we have um, basically backed ourselves out that if it does not affect me, <laughs> then it doesn't matter. And we start even seeing our own brothers and sisters as um, basically hoodlums, thugs, criminals, they get what they deserve. And so our mindset has shifted, whereas this mindset was how do we have human fulfillment and liberation and help others also <coughs> accomplish that? Okay? Or what we call individual, individualized. All right. Some of these names, and I put some pictures up here so you all can get it, so that you can see these individuals because they are young. These were the individuals of SNCC. Diane Nash. What's this guy's name? Who is he? Mayor of DC. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said mayor for life. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that, isn't that amazing? I know. <laughs> so, so wait a minute. Look at these people. Mayor and Bear, who else? These folks were active, but they were young, they were engaged. So when you talk about SNCC, and SNCC is? Student. Student. All right, now there we go. SNCC was, King thought, let me say it that way. King thought that SNCC was going to be a younger extension. Okay, again, that's in your handout, in your portal. Why do I keep saying that? Oh, wonderful, there we go. So. King thought they were going to be extension, but they said, no, we're going to be an independent body striving for liberation. No. Fannie Lou Hamer. Oh, I thought he started walking through the No. That's Fannie Lou Hamer. That's um, Diane Nash. That's James Bevel. These were the founding members. Okay, and, and one other guy that I'm going to show in a few minutes, James Lawson. Okay, so these individuals, now this PowerPoint is in your portal. Okay, and I want y'all to see this because these folks were doing lunch counter sit-ins. They were doing the Freedom Summer, riding the 
riding a bus, which we call Freedom Riders. These folks were active. They were registering folks in Mississippi and Alabama to vote. There you go. Now y'all, yeah. oh, somebody's reading. Thank you. Oh. So these folks were not just sitting around waiting on King to speak and point. They were, okay, particularly. Now the reason I want y'all to hear this is I said what? And that was females who are actively engaged. And all we do is talk about the mean. These women were actively engaged. Diane Nash, Fannie Lou Hamer, those are founding members who had major voice in the movement. That we really what? We don't recognize and we ignore them. Okay, yes ma'am. Can you expound more on what happened in unbidding the conflict with SNCC and, SCL and SCLC? Can I expound on? The conflict, the internal conflicts between SNCC and SCLC and Albany, Georgia. These folks were very active. And they kept wanting to see more activity done. Um, even with um, John Lewis. When King does this, I have a dream speech. Mm -hmm. John Lewis wants to get up there and take on John F. Kennedy. He wants to make the speech, and they have him rewrite. So these folks, although nonviolent, they're not that, let's just step back and let's, they really want to engage. They want more activity. They want to see more movement. And they're not seeing that through SCLC, which is causing tension. And then you got SCLC saying, well, hey, wait a minute. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do it that way. They're, they are more into we are in control. And SNCC saying no. Because SNCC is going to invite Malcolm down in mm -hmm. and, and, and the time that King is in prison in order to deliver a speech. And, you know, that's going to be some tension there. Oh, yeah. There's some struggle there. So they don't really, these individuals, really, although nonviolent, they really are those students that are very intelligent, very engaged, very active, very radical, and ready to pull in more voices than just can. Yes, ma'am. So do you feel like it's the SCLC pulled back some when some of their major leaders started dying? When yeah. you start seeing people picked off, they kind of they calmed down because they were afraid of the, the death that was coming. No, well, I think they pulled back the more they got, um, the more they had access to the White House, to other political power structures. I think at times they were trying to balance the two, whereas SNCC was trying to make some changes. Yeah. And they were like, no, we're going to push this. We're going to push this envelope. Yeah. So if, in, in your thinking, if it were a conflict between SNCC and SNCC, were the more prominent, stronger organization, do you think that would have served us more? I'm just, I don't that, know. Time has a way of changing and engaging these other power structures and dealing with systems. <clears throat> they have a way of changing you. So I'm not sure. Um, I do know that they, again, at that time, wanted to be more radical in what was going on. And King was trying to be very strategic. What I wanted y'all to hear was it must have been a tough place for him to be, to be attacked from outside, inside, and then trying to sit on all of this. Because this is, this is, this is, this is major. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. There is, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a, they say, um, that people were planted in these um, different uh, mm -hmm. uh, the different movements and organizations, mm -hmm. and um, they accomplish what. Yeah. yeah. The FBI papers on oh. Malcolm and Martin, mm -hmm. um, and several other works yeah. have said yes, there were individuals who were placed oh. in these different organizations to derail them. That a part of it also occurs when King is assassinated. That that um, the economic 
um, boycott that they had planned, which we call um, the garbage men's poor, yeah. poor people. Yeah. Well, that was before the poor people's okay. country. Yeah. But when he goes down to Memphis yeah, and the garbage right. worker strikes, thank you, I was blocking yeah. it. Yeah. Garbage worker strike. That that whole the first time that whole violence was through plants right. that they had played they had put inside of the movement. Right. So, but it had been going on for a while. Okay. okay. One of the things I wanted y'all also to get was more than how many students? Uh, these students. These were college students. Yes, sir. Yes. These are college students. Okay. And and this movement also is going to bring in children. You got to remember, but okay, they're also young children. So you will see when we take a look next week at. Eyes on the prize. You'll see them interviewing one kid, and the young child said, they, they, uh, interviewer says, what do you want? And the young child said, feed them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so you'll see these things. You'll yeah. see. So, you know, the kids were coming out, they were spilling out. So this is, again, this whole communal family movement that is going to take place. But everybody is not on board with this. Okay. The Woolworth in uh, Washington, D.C., my grandmother, my mom, and myself, I was, I had to be four years old when I was there. Oh. I heard that. I was I heard that. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I had to be. Well, you got to remember, those were difficult times, and it was not just the South. Okay? There, there was a lot of what we call racism and segregation, a lot in the north as well, okay? All right, can you hit this? Okay, now this is what I want y'all to get. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee founded when? April 1960. By who? Young, young people. people. The young people, college students, African-American college students. So the FBI papers on Malcolm and Martin, one of the things that they asked is, how can we make sure that this movement never occur again? One of the things that they identify as the power, one of the power bases is black colleges. Right. That's one of the first things, I mean, that's one of the things, excuse me, not first, but one of the things that they identify is that you really have to derail black colleges. Right. Okay? They had uh, files on prominent black writers. That's true. And yeah. they, they tracked their travel, what they were writing, who they were writing to. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a new book coming out on that. Okay. On the on FBI files on prominent black writers. Yeah. Yeah. You need to understand who was leading the FBI at that time, and he's keeping his hand on the pulse, on presidents and everybody else. Okay. There you go. Okay. Okay. We talked about this. Make sure you go in your portals, though. Okay. Can you go over? All right. Um, the Freedom Rides, 1961, the test, um, the 1960 Supreme Court ruling that declared segregation in interstate travel facilities unconstitutional. So while you had them on the books, they were not being enacted. They were not being carried out. So you had laws that had been passed, which is why I wanted y'all to see that, number one, you can put laws on books. Okay? And that's where the, the issue is. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be enforced? And that became the challenge. We could not have done this, and King could not have done this, without those laws on the books. Right. The laws were there. And you hold, I mean, you owe that to Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood his Marshall. teams. I mean, there were laws that was, that was again, mm -hmm. making it um, available for us to start talking about Wait a minute, we can do this. Can do it. Yeah. So even though there were federal laws, the state there you go. did not have to. There you go. That's the reason why we kept saying, and you all have heard me say, state rights. State rights is telling you something. So when a lot of these individuals start saying state rights, this is what they're saying. There you go. And that's why I'm saying. You got to hear the cycle of history and what these folks are arguing. There you go. Okay, if you would. Congress of Racial um, Equality initially sponsored the Freedom Rides that began in May 1961, but segregationists viciously attacked riders traveling through Alabama. Students from Nashville 
Under the leadership of who? Zionist. Who? Zionist. Okay. Core is, is farmer. Huh? Is that farmer core? That's, yeah. That's um what's farmer's first name? Um Oh, I'm blocking his name. James. James Farmer. Yeah, that's James Farmer's organization. And you all saw him in The Great Debates. Yes. That's James Farmer. Okay. Younger. Okay. That's James Farmer. Okay? Yeah. But one of the things I want y'all to see was Diane Nash. Mm -hmm. So these women were active. Okay? Hit that again. That's Diane Nash. Yes. And Diane Nash will be, um, she's a student at Fisk, but she transfers from Howard. Howard. She transferred from Howard University to Fisk. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and stand up like a good bison. Go ahead. All right. All right, so, one of the also, uh, you need to look at the Rock Hill Nine. Nine students in prison after a lunch counter sit-in. She served jail time. I remember that was on television. They drug them kids out of that, 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 uh, they, they, they drug them out of there just to kill them. That lunch cattle, they were not pleased at all. Yeah. You, what, I, what I want y'all to see is how committed. Now, this is SNCC. This is not SCLC. This is SNCC. All right? Most of the time when you see SCLC, you hear nothing but the men. You see nothing but the men. But you're going to see Diane Nash. Right. You're going to see Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. You're going to see even inside the Black Panther. So you're starting to see these women right. that's rising mm -hmm. and actively engaged. And this is a part of the history that we ignore. Right. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's a part that we ignore. So I wanted y'all to see her. Beautiful young lady. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, yeah, we can... We can we can move. Oh, wait a minute. No, okay. Go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> Vanderbilt University theology student James Lawson. James Lawson is asked by King to leave his university and come south and to begin teaching the nonviolent workshops. Okay? Yes, sir. I've, I've read in some scholarships that I guess, based on what you said, he chose not to and he was asked or kicked out by the university because of what he was doing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Vanderbilt at that time was considered very liberal. Right. Um, the administration even went in. The school kicked him out. Right. The theology department and school, divinity school, um, they went and fought for him. To be reinstated. Oh, okay. And so it, it put in attention on Vanderbilt's campus. Wow. Okay? Lawson is training individuals. King asked him. That's what I want y'all to get. King asked him. He was up north in seminary. King asked him to come down. And Lawson comes down and starts teaching. Teaching, not in school, but teaching individuals how to be nonviolent. And what we call nonviolent direct action. Okay? So he is a major voice in this as he talks about, about training. And this is in Nashville. This is with Diane Nash. Here he is talking about nonviolence. And it cost him to be kicked out of school. In other words, this movement and fighting for this liberation will cost you. Okay? You get that? Yes, ma'am. Professor, what amazed me when I was reading is they had such structure. Yeah. They, they, it, it, it just, it floored me because we can't, we don't have that kind of structure. Now. We don't know how to structure our young people. We don't know how to structure our children to have this type of commitment. Yeah. To have this type of guts to do anything. Yeah. To piece them together for one hour. Yeah. These individuals had a great deal of discipline. Uh, one of the things I want y'all to see here, this is, this is him at that age. Um, and of course, he's much older now. He's in his 80s, almost 90. Um, yeah. Um, young man, would you not say? Yeah. Young man. 
This is what King said about him. And he even mentioned him in his mountaintop speech. Martin Luther King spoke of Lawson as one of, the, one of the noble men who had influenced the black freedom struggle. He's been going to jail for struggling. He's been kicked out of Vanderbilt for this struggle. But he's still going on, fighting for the rights of his people. That's Lawson. Okay? Now, we affirm the philosophical or religious ideal of nonviolence as the foundation of our purpose, presupposition of our faith and the manner of our action. Nonviolence as it grows from Judaic Christian tradition seeks a social order of justice permeated by love. Lawson, April 17, 1960. In May 1960, the group constituted itself as a permanent organization and Fisk University student was his first president. <laughs> and guess who that is? A young, vibrant Marion Bear. All right? Exceptional, intelligent student. He will receive a master's. He was going to receive a Ph.D. or was going to pursue, excuse me, a Ph.D. And he moved to Washington to start and launch a local chapter. So you, you're starting to see these individuals. Okay, these are not, like you said, these folks are disciplined. They're not just little.